It's my pleasure. It's great to be here, especially on a very cool and hip show that's focused on, <laughs> on some of the most beautiful music written, really the golden age of American music. I, you know, we're so lucky to have this really specific taste for this show. Our, our uh, listeners, our little community here, we're fierce and specific in our taste. <laughs> so I'm really interested in, we talked a little bit, but how, who would you say influenced your conducting style the most? We've talked about a bit before this interview about how it's all about communication and who would you say really influenced the way that you communicate to your musicians and to your audience? It's a great question. I, I think, you know, when I was a young student, I was influenced by some of the great maestros of the 20th century, people like Herbert Poncarion, who used to conduct mm. the Berlin Philharmonic, Arturo Toscanini, who was very famous in the early part of the 20th century. Um, but I went to Tanglewood one year and I discovered, um, well, I met the great Seiji Ozawa who was music director of the Boston Philharmonic and actually also music director of the San Francisco Symphony for many years as well. Oh, wow. And Seiji was a very physical, very dynamic conductor, almost dancing on the podium. And um, when I went to Tango with that summer, I also got to work with briefly Leonard Bernstein. I don't know if wow. you know who Leonard Bernstein was, but you know, in, in it, I, I don't take that for granted anymore, even though he's perhaps the most famous American conductor, there seems to be a passing of the guard. A lot of people don't know, you know the, the big names who made classical music so popular in the 20th century. Anyway, what I discovered by Leonard Bernstein is not only his conducting style, because when you see him conduct, he conducts with so much passion and humanity, mm. which was so unusual in the 1950s and 60s and all the way through uh, the latter part of the 20th century up to that point conductors were supposed to be very serious people with a scowl on their face and intimidating and the word maestro which means master you know which i hate that word i hate the word maestro. <laughs> it's like that seinfeld episode i don't know if you've ever seen it but where this guy takes his self way too seriously so i don't let anyone call me maestro but you know leonard bernstein had a way of articulating and being a wonderful ambassador for, I don't want to call it just classical music, but I would say art in general. He, he was not afraid of singing Elvis Presley or the Beatles to get people to understand Tchaikovsky. Or of course he wrote West Side Story, right. which you know the, the music director of the New York Philharmonic also wrote one of the most important Broadway musicals. He was willing to cross lines and cross borders. So to answer your question, Shan, I, I would have to say that Leonard Bernstein is, has been my greatest model. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, you know, Leonard Bernstein really shone a light on lyricist Sondheim in West Side Story as well. I mean, I think that was Sondheim's debut. And uh, I know he references that experience a lot of 1957 West Side Story. And uh, and then Bernstein, I believe, worked with Jerome Jerome Robbins again on On the Town, or actually On the Town, but before West Side Story in 1944. So it's been really interesting to learn about that sort of little niche there, um, the little group they had going on. Would you well, say you like, prefer? Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I'll just quickly say it was an incredibly fertile time in New York in the 1950s. It's kind of like Paris in the 1920s so many great artists converging and that was a uh, west side story is one of those kind of uh, where the moons and stars aligned beautifully mm -hmm. right and would you say you prefer bernstein's more operatic pieces or the soundtracks you know he had like his candide and where was a quiet place uh and then of course you know west side story and everything we talked about do you have any preference i love i'm a bernstein nerd so of course i'm going to ask oh, a lot about him <laughs> I, well I, i'm very impressed i'm very very impressed oh, no. with all this. It, i would have to say you know of, of course i love his classical works but i i think where he really shined was in west side story as his great oeuvre um, it, and in some ways, it, I, I think it kind of tortured him because I think he really was obsessed with communicating beautiful music that made that was relevant to a large society. His dream was to make the New York Philharmonic, when he was music director of that, to make it America's orchestra. And I think if he didn't feel the pressure of being classical, I think he probably would have continued to write other Broadway musicals. And mm. who knows what would have been a great successor. 
Um, he wrote these mini operettas called like, like Trouble in Tahiti and these other pieces that were really art pieces. But, you know, I, I just think his pure ex exuberance, the center of his being was having fun. And that's where West Side Story shines so beautifully. Right. And I mean, he was known for bringing out the best in his musicians and having these impact in audiences. And how would you say as conductor and leader of the musicians, how would you say you bring out the best qualities and the unique sort of flavors of your musicians? And what kind of impact do you hope to have on the audience um, from bringing out that unique color that, you know, conduct only conductors can do? The perfect question. And I would say that as a conductor, and I love the word conductor, because, you know, if you think about in, in science or um, in metallurgy, uh, a good conductor is something that passes energy from one, like copper mm -hmm. is a good conductor. Um, rubber is not a good conductor. And I am, I transmit the energy of the conductor to the musicians with great passion, as if, as if Beethoven, Mozart, or Bernstein were alive and on the podium trying to get something emotional from them. And then I am a conductor from the musicians to the audience. And so I want the audience to leave feeling lots of humanity. They want to know that if Mozart had a sense of humor or if that Gustav Mahler was neurotic or, mm -hmm. or all of the wonderful, and the musicians themselves on stage, I want the audience to feel that this musician has a sense of humor or um, that making music is, is what matters most to them in life. That is, that is my goal at the concert, not to, not to regurgitate, not to be a museum piece, but to be a manufacturer of passion. Oh, wow. Manufacturer of passion. Wow. That's, that's amazing. And how has it been working with um, Julius and Mark? I don't know how much you've worked together as a team yet with Julius, Mark, and then your orchestra. How has that been sort of, what's the synergy been like with that group? Wow, what an incredible, incredible pleasure. Julius, as you mentioned, is the lead star of Hamilton. Oh, incredible. In Hamilton. I mean, the hottest musical on the planet, it, just incredible. And he's the lead star coming to Union City, coming to the East Bay. We are so blessed. And then Mark Kapitsky, who is a swingingist, groovingist guy, who is the lead singer with the Glenn Miller Orchestra. Together, you know, I mean, even separately, they're worth the price of admission. But together, you're going, wow, how is it that you've got Michael Jordan and, you know, you've got uh, Tom Brady in the same room together? Uh, and how do they work together? The, the, the person who's the, the star of the big kind of rap musical, um, Hamilton and, and Big Band, it works beautifully because they are best friends. They dreamed of the really? show for years. Wow. They perform together. There's so much mutual admiration. And when they sing together, it is like it's like peanut butter and jelly it's so perfect absolutely <laughs> moving and they and they're funny and they're dancing and they're 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 all over the stage and these arrangements for the orchestra are gorgeous the orchestra wow. is just singing so beautifully so this is a, this is a dream come true for them and this is an incredible unique opportunity because this is going to be the the west coast premiere of this show uh on that march 3rd and 4th right and tickets at Bay Phil, Bay, P -H -I -L org again. Right. And I mean, just on paper, it sounds incredible that Julius as the star of Hamilton and then the lead singer of Glenn Miller Band. I mean, and I'm a huge fan of them as well. And many, many of our listeners are. And then, you know, Bernst, uh, Bernstein nerd as yourself. I can't, <laughs> I just on paper, it's perfect. And then it's so great to hear that in person. It's just this incredible time together of worlds. Well, you know, let me let me just give you you and your listeners a little bit of a taste of what they're going to be hearing because you know, Chan, you you are incredible. They have such a wide eclectic taste, uh, and I'm sure you love the Beatles as well and all oh, yeah. these other you know great great music. It, it, I, I can't remember who said it with, with Louis Armstrong, but you know, um, the, the, it's all good. It's all good music. Um, you know, everything from the big band uh, mu music like "I've Got You Under My Skin" and "Night and Day," Frank Sinatra. But a lot of songs by Michael Bublé as well. Um, we'll be singing um, "Home" and um, oh. a really swinging ar arrangement of just just one of those things, and Sammy Davis Jr.'s arrangement of "Birth of the Blues," oh. and then and then they do, they do these mish mashups between Stevie Wonder and some of this 
classic stuff like they they do a mashup of Sir Duke Steve and it don't mean a thing by Duke Ellington in oh, wow. one song. Going, really? Oh. Yes, and it's just it's incredible. Um, wow. they're gonna, uh, Julius uh, has such a fascinating background growing up in Indiana, and because of that, he loves the Jackson Five, worships the Jackson Five. So we're going to be doing um, a, a bunch of hits from the Jackson Five, uh, ABC, I think, and um, and and some other really familiar Jackson Five mel- melodies. And then, yes, Julius is going to sing a little bit of Hamilton, but he's not going to sing the song when he's playing Hamilton. Um, he's going to be singing, I think, um, uh, one of the, the major songs from the other characters, Wait For mm-hmm. It. Mm-hmm. And, yep. and so he's been dying to sing that, and so he's going to sing Wait For It. And then we end the second half with Sing, 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 which is a really oh. rousing number where the orchestra and our drummer gets to show off. I mean, my favorite part of seeing Broadway performers, not in their actual shows, but in the showcases and, and uh, concerts outside of their productions, is really seeing them sing the songs that you de- don't get to see when they're on Broadway. So seeing the songs that they really want to sing that they can, it's not part of their, that's always the best because they've been sitting there night after night seeing this song being sung so well. And now they get there, you know, it's always, always good stuff. I've always loved that. And you bring up a good point because whenever I work with an artist, whether it's someone famous like you know Yo-Yo Ma or Joshua Bell or Johnny Cash or James Taylor, I try to make their experience with me feel unique because mm-hmm. sometimes they do so many concerts a year. So by giving Julius a chance to sing a song he doesn't normally sing, I think makes a whole evening feel more special for him too. Oh, sure. And it's, you know, having such a visual el- element um, or a form of expression like the musical and then you mentioned having Duke Duke Ellington which is in my opinion one of the most visual musicians ever since he had you know the synesthesia and that's how he wrote his music was in palettes because he would see the music through color and he would create yes. his his albums through palettes and so I always whenever I think Duke Ellington I think of that visual element that seems like it would marry so well into this sort of um you know musical Hamilton but also you know Michael Buble these and Jackson five these very visual musicians and so that sounds like a perfect uh perfect marriage there <laughs> Well, it, it is going to be a very visual show, but b- before I, I talk about the video, I didn't know Duke Ellington had synesthesia. Yeah, he did. And I know this because I interviewed, I didn't know this until I interviewed his nephew, Doug Ellington, who is also a uh, jazz musician now, who also has synesthesia. And I know I had no idea about this. And he said that he grew up uh, seeing everyone compose with these colors. And he, Duke Ellington, would write a song in a key and that was really a color to him and so then when he would sing it he would realize it was in the wrong key if he heard the wrong color and yeah and he said that he told his nephew that he composed all of his songs and albums with palettes in mind so it'd be different shades of browns and earthy colors and you can looking or listening back you can i then i start to feel it like oh this does feel like that sort of color so maybe that's uh projecting but yeah so i always think of very visual um, a lot of visuals just from hearing Duke Ellington. So I'm a very visual person. So I'm drawn to musicals and and uh, and also expressive conductors like Bernstein. And you know, we're just just watching them as a show in itself. Um, that that's what I hope that that people who come to the show and, and as I start to make my way back to the Bay Area because I grew up in the Bay Area, but they've been away for a long, long time. Oh wow! Um, is that if they come to the show, they will not see a conductor, namely me, on the podium. But they'll see a dancer. They'll see an interpreter. Um, I, I I think one of the things that people just say when they see me conduct is just so much joy. They ask me, "Are are you having as much fun as you look like?" And the answer is unequivocally yes. <laughs> um, but I do want to talk about video. Is, is that this show is not just a concert. It's really it's almost like a Broadway musical where you're going to meet Julius and Mark, and they're going to tell you their life story going to tell you how they had a dream of performing and how they reached the top of their professions and how they came together as 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 musical colleagues and we're going to see videos of their childhood we're going to see videos of them performing um beautiful uh graphic and lighting images on the screen it's not just a concert it feels like a broadway show oh wow yeah and uh i 
you know, all of our listeners are going to be so interested in that. And then I also, our show is syndicated to KXCI Tucson as well. So hopefully maybe someday you'll get out to Arizona or they can watch this interview and, and maybe stream it or some, some sort of new technology that's out there. Um, oh, I, I love it. I, I've been to Tucson as well. It's a beautiful city. I yeah. grew up in Tucson. Yeah, that's, oh, really? that's, oh, oh, it's, it's so yeah. underrated. And I like that. Don't mess up Tucson. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, yeah. so, it's so spiritual. You know, we think of, yeah. of, of, of parts of Arizona, uh, other parts of Arizona as being spiritual. I find that the, the geography of Tucson is just so healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I had mentioned before, not to, you brought up Tucson, so now I'm just going to mention a little bit of it, but we talked a bit before about um, conductors in my life, uh -huh. and the best part of Tucson is that people in, I would say, Bay Area, major, you know, areas in the country, when they're like, okay, let's get away, let's get back to our, let's calm down and kind of, they move to Tucson. So you get these incredible talents that just end up in Arizona because the, the vibe is that draws them to it, you know, Tucson and Sedona. And so we have talents like Dr. Jonathan, who I mentioned before. So I'm, that makes me so happy that you love Tucson. I don't get to hear do that very often. Tucson. Absolutely. And my, I also have another question. What would you say in, so it's incredible taking all these different elements and putting them together and they lend themselves so well, but what would you say were the biggest obstacles in putting together these scores in putting together the show? What would you say was, you know, it's, it's marrying so well, but there's gotta be, you know, some, uh, some competing elements there. Oh, good question. Um, and, and by the way, I said March 3rd and 4th early. It's, I just want to remind listeners, it's March 4th and 5th, Saturday and Sunday. 4th and uh, 5th. Evening of the 4th and afternoon of the 5th. The greatest challenge that we had with the show is that these guys have such eclectic tastes. They wanted to do everything from Michael Bublé to Jackson 5 and how to put it all together in a narrative. So we sat down and said, okay, let's start with your story first. And so they they. They, they wrote out a script, they wrote out a story that is very moving and personal and emotional. And then we took all the songs that they loved and then we paired it together. It's kind of like when uh, the, the Tina Turner story on Broadway oh, or the Carol, yeah. Carol King story, you take these uh, groups, uh, uh, the, like um, Frankie Valli and the Four Seasons, uh, the Jersey Boys. Just putting the songs together is not gonna make a great musical or a great story. Gotta start with a great story. So that's what that's what we did, and so um, that was I, I don't know if it was the greatest challenge, but it was it took the longest for us mm -hmm. to create um, a, a, an evening, a, a two hour show where you felt like you have you, you deeply understand who these two great artists are, and and yet you it's like this wild iPod party. You know, I mean, none of us have iPods anymore, but it's it's your own you know <laughs> iTunes collection. Most of us don't have just one kind of song on your on your iTunes. You usually have like ten different styles, and that's what you're going to feel like when you left this. It's not going to just be rock and roll, and not just going to be swing or whatever. But you're going to leave going, "Holy cow! I just heard all this great music that just makes my heart smile." Yeah, and I think also uh, when you're talking about the sort of mashups you put together with uh, Stevie Wonder, and I think you mentioned Duke Ellington and yes. and Jackson Five, it's all of that is rooted in this amazing older music, right? I, at least my favorite, and those are all my favorite modern bands as well. All of that good stuff you can find it all in the uh, in the old music, like even 1920s Harlem Renaissance. You can find that heart still in the modern. So it's funny that it's still that same beautiful heart and soul and uh that seems to be this um you know heartbeat across your show i'm i mean i'm definitely going to be there <laughs> so so that that's the one thing i think you you nailed it is that and that's what you know mark and julius are also young people mm. um that they're drawn to this music and you're drawn to this music there is a new generation there there's a tidal wave coming of younger people who it's not just rediscovering this music as if as if you're brushing off an old antique what you're drawn to is just quality mm -hmm. you're just drawn to great music whether it's it's 70 years ago or 50 years ago or 25 years ago it, and, and i think it's a little bit of an uh, maybe a slight uh, indictment on a lot of modern pop music that it doesn't necessarily have the sophistication of harmony and melody mm -hmm. And, and orchestration, 
Um, and I, I sound like an old man, and I don't mean to, and perhaps I am, but <laughs> I, I don't think young people are being drawn to it because it's old music. I think you're, you're just wanting to find the very best sushi in town. Yeah, I, I, I feel that it's older music just has this communication that exists more than maybe, maybe I'm an old, old soul myself, but that sort of communicating musical elements, I feel like that's kind of what's missing. And it's funny that you mention newer music and newer audiences with older music. So Moonlight, Moon ST, this show, I pitched it to my radio stations as, um, uh, Broadway show tunes and old music because the vision was that you could listen to it with your grandparents on the roof and like and everyone likes the music because modern Broadway it still is you know old pop music were, were show tunes and so it really is the same genre just in, expressed in different ways and I think they're put off maybe by the recording the the way it was recorded is antiquated but really the the intention is still the same I think across those that genre so that's it's kind of like Moon ST in concert I'm so excited <laughs> I'm so excited it is. If, if, if Shan came up with a show this is it you know if, if Moon <laughs> If MST was um, a three-dimensional show, we're presenting it on March 4th and 5th. A a absolutely. And can I just say one more thing that you're talking about? Of course. Um, being, drawn to, uh, being drawn to quality and, and finding the heartbeat of, of, of music is that um, that is, you know, my goal with the Bay Philharmonic, just to give, give a, a little bit of vision of, we just changed our name from the Fremont Symphony, which is a wonderful name. but. The Bay Philharmonic, we really, really thought about the name long and hard, and we wanted to have a name that felt completely accessible to every single person of every ethnicity, every racial background, every um, gender and religious background and cultural background, and every generation as well. We don't, I, I, I don't call, describe it as a symphony. I don't describe what we do as just classical music. It is purely about having fun and giving the best show and 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 having as much emotion on stage as possible. So, you know, I think you and I are, uh, and the show are of the same spirit. It's that it's, let's not, let's not categorize things. <laughs> let's just have a good time. Yeah. And I mean, the Bay Area is the perfect place, you know, this whole spectrum of cultures. And I mean, if there's in New York and in the Bay Area, how can you get more of a spectrum of cultures and, and taste than that? So what a great place to bring it to as well. And I'm excited to welcome you back home. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm yeah. very proud. I grew up in Cupertino and I went to oh, Lindsay wow. High School there. So um, I could not be prouder of the Bay Area, particularly South Bay and East Bay. I just love it. Great restaurant. Oh, oh the best, the best. And if, is there anything else you'd like to share? I don't want to take up too much of your time, but if there's anything else you'd like to share? Um, yes. I, I just, one more thing is of that course. aside from our concert on March 4th and 5th, we're going to end the season with a rockin' Beethoven program. You're probably thinking, oh my goodness, how, how, how rockin' can Beethoven be? <laughs> well, on, on June 3rd and 4th, because we give concerts about every three months, um, I'm going to present Beethoven's Seventh Symphony, which is one of the most energetic and infectiously joyous symphonies he's ever written, along with a soloist, Shan, I think you would love him. His, his name is Charlie Albright, and he's an amazing young man. He's just as young as you are, and he can improvise like no one's business. I mean, oh, of wow. all different kinds of styles, of jazz, of classical, of all the different eras, and he's so energetic. It reminds me of Jerry Lee Lewis. If Jerry Lee Lewis met um, uh, uh, Horowitz, you would have uh, Charlie Alb Albright in terms of the energy, and he's going to be doing Piano Concerto number three. Um, oh, wow. Stay tuned, not only for this season, but we're going to be announcing next season in just a couple of weeks. Oh, well, that's so exciting. I'm excited to see all these new seasons with the uh, the former Fremont, now Bay Philharmonic, and head over to Bay Phil, that's P H I L dot org, bayphil.org, to check out their new season and support them in the future as well. I know the Bay Area is excited to have even more quality music in our ears, live music. And thank you so much for joining me. This was amazing conversation and uh and i you know break a leg and i'm excited to see your production on march 4th the 5th you can get tickets at bayphil.org thank you so much jung ho i really appreciate your time it was so much fun it, yeah. was, it was 
it was, it, you, we are, we are um, uh, souls in, in, in our sp and spirits together. Thank you so much. It's yes. great to meet you. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye.